Good afternoon and welcome to the Cambridgeshire County Council Children and Young People's Committee. The meeting room has been arranged today to comply with public health guidance on COVID safety and social distancing. Given the current concerns about the Omicron variant, the Director of Public Health has advised that face coverings should be worn throughout the meeting, except when speaking, to reduce the risk. To minimise the number of attendees, all officers except the, the Executive Director for People and Communities and the Democratic Services Officer will be attending remotely. In accordance with our constitution, I will briefly adjourn the meeting for a comfort break if the meeting exceeds two hours. There is no fire alarm test scheduled for today, so if the alarm sounds, please leave by the nearest marked fire exit and assemble in the car park. Uh, before we begin, I want to congratulate Charlotte Black on her appointment as the new Executive Director for People and Communities and to welcome her to her first Children and Young People meeting in that role. Um, we've also asked Wendy uh, to introduce Charlotte for, for us at the start of this meeting. But before we move to that, Wendy, um, this is the last meeting for Wendy Ogilwellbaum today and also the last meeting for Lou Williams. Uh, they're both due to retire. So if you might indulge me in a few words about Wendy and uh, Maria is going to do the same about Lou. Thank you. So Wendy joined Cambridgeshire County Council in 1987, so 35 years of service. Um, Wendy began as a residential worker 
going on to qualify as a social worker and then moving up to managing the council's family support and adolescent care services. In 2004, she briefly had a sojourn to Bedfordshire and on to Essex before returning to Peterborough. In 2012, she became Executive Director of People Communities across Cambridgeshire and Peterborough in 2017. Though I've only worked with Wendy since May, I've been touched by her sincerity, conscientiousness and strategic thought. I've also spoken to the previous Chair of Children and Young People, Simon Bywater, and he agreed that the strength Wendy has brought to the role has been a key part of the Children and Young People work. Whilst we are disappointed to not have you physically here today, the legacy you have built and the Wendy who began as a residential worker leaves a considerable imprint in Cambridgeshire and we are deeply grateful for all you have done. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, can I say a few words? We've never stopped you saying a few words, <laughs> Wendy. Go ahead, please. So just to say thank you, that's uh, uh, very kind. I didn't know you, you knew about my history in terms of starting a, uh, in Cambridgeshire. Uh, and you'll know from that history that children have always been my passion. I actually see that it's been a privilege for me to be able to work in an area that I feel passionate about. Um, I've genuinely loved being on the Children and Young People's Committee, and I think we've uh, achieved an awful lot, and I've really enjoyed uh, working with all members, and I, I, I want to thank you for that. What I will say is that um, I do leave you in very capable hands. Um, Charlotte Black, most of you know her, is exceptional. I think she brings the same passion, values and beliefs that I brought to the table. Um, and I know she will be a great success. So just thank you very much. And I wish you all well for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And um, it's um, if we think about it, um, we in both Lou and Wendy, we are losing about 70 years of amazing competence and expertise. Let's just take a pause to think about it. So um, Lou has given 35 years of his career to children's services. Uh, he joined Peaceborough County Council nine years ago, but uh, he's been doing the job he's currently doing, Director of Children's Services for Peaceborough and Cambridgeshire for the last three years. And um, I think, and I hope you all agree that children's services is like, you know, okay, let's say one of, if not the most important area of our council work. And uh, the, the experience and the, the expertise and competence and the dedication Lou has given to that area um, has enabled real differences in the lives of children and young people and families. And his, uh, his, his dedication and uh, commitment has brought together many partners, agencies and staff in prioritizing safeguarding um, children and young people throughout both counties, Cambridge and Peaceborough. And uh, um, I think also, I hope you all agree that Lou will leave big shoes to fill and uh, his successor will have to hit the ground running on all the work which has gone into uh, Children and Maternity Collaborative and it's Quite an exciting time, uh, quite daunting as well, but I kind of hope that we, um, you know, we collectively will pick it up and uh, do its justice. But um, just uh, from all of us, Lou, absolutely all the best for the future. You were, uh, I think, fair to say from my personal perspective, one of the most important people in my council life from May and I have learned so much in a short space of time and thank you so, so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Maria. And um, just to say, that's really, really good cool of you. And I, I, I'd echo what Wendy said. Wendy, I'm not going to repeat what Wendy said, but I've loved working with this committee, loved working in Cambridgeshire and absolutely have loved um, my career working to support the needs of vulnerable children and young people. So thank you all very much. And um, it's a shame you can't be there in person, but I really appreciate the sentiment. Thank you, Maria and, and colleagues. 
Thank you. And uh, we all welcome Charlotte Black and uh, her wealth of experience. She has worked previously in children and um, most recently in adults and safeguarding and brings a huge amount of experience. And uh, we've started work together already and uh, look forward to continuing. Thank you. When did you want to add anything else or are we? Oh, that's fine. I shall leave it in Charlotte's capable hands now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wendy. Lovely. So item one. Thank you. Item one is apologies for absence and declarations of interest. Uh, would the Democratic Services Officer report any apologies, please? Uh, thank you. We have apologies from Councillor Prentice, um, who will be substituted, I think, by Councillor Gowing, if he's able to join us. From Councillor Thompson, who is substituted by Councillor Bradnam, and from Flavio Vitesi, who is the co-opted co member representing the Roman Catholic Diocese of East Anglia. Councillor Hoy, please. Yeah, Councillor Gowing asked me to um, pass on his apologies. He was planning to substitute today, but sadly last night he was unwell. Thank you, noted. Oh, and Councillor Sharp. Thank you, Chair. It's on uh, um, declarations of interest. It's not really, I think I should mention it because on page 139, my name is on the agenda as an LEA governor appointee of Borough Green primary. I was previously a foundation governor, so it's on my declaration of interest anyway, but I feel as my name's on the agenda, I should mention it now. Thank you, Councillor Gowing, and thank you to your for your service as a governor. It's a really key role, and we do appreciate all of our local governors. Um, does anybody else have any disclosable pecuniary interest or non-statutory disclosable interest today? Marcus? Item two. So item two is the minutes of the previous meeting and the action log. We're being asked to approve these minutes. Oh, hello. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Chair. <laughs> Councillor Daunton. Um, yes, thank you, thank you Chair. Um, I, I'm a governor of a school. Do I, is that a, no, uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we're very spread out. Uh, it's difficult to see everybody. Um, we're being asked to approve the minutes of the meeting on the 30th of November as an accurate record. Can I ask any member who doesn't agree with this to raise their hand now, please? Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Can I just abstain because I wasn't there, please? Thank you. Anybody else? No. In which case, as I see no objections to the proposal, we'll approve these minutes as an accurate record and take it as carried unanimously with that abstention. Thank you. An updated action log was included in the published papers for this meeting. Do any members have any questions on the action log or can we take it as noted? Councillor Hoy, please. Yeah, just a comment on the household support fund. Um, I probably, we hopefully won't have this problem again in the future because I think it might now be over, but it was just a little disappointing to see that it hasn't been spent and we, we were assured that there was avenues for people to um, apply and spend it. And now we saw that last night in the uh, on social media that it hasn't been spent. And so as such, we're giving out uh, the money to everyone. Um, I don't know if that will be successful because obviously we're still asking people to apply for that. And if they didn't apply last time, I'm not sure they will now. Um, but just wanted to sort of say, I was a little bit disappointed that it hasn't been been spent when we were we were assured that there were ample opportunities for it to be distributed. I think that's ongoing until March, so um, hopefully we can get that money spent and and uh, get it to the right people in the community. Uh, Councillor King, please. Yeah, just to add uh, to that, we are hoping to be able to spend money on Easter holiday. Um, supermarket vouchers as well so um, and I think uh, Councillor Hoy when you say everyone that's people who receive universal credit right yeah okay just to qualify that just to make sure everyone is on one page thanks uh, Councillor Slatter please Thank you. Yes, I'm a bit unsettled by Councillor Hoy's contribution because I'm telling people about the household support fund. If people come to my drop-ins, I'm showing them. I'm putting posters up in other places at the moment. I, I thought it was something that was carrying on until March. 
And when we've got new people coming and new people falling into difficulties financially, could I be reassured by the officers or our chair, please? Thank you. It is ongoing until March and it's being distributed. Uh, there are various posters and, and social media outlets that you can use. And also um, the Cosmic Committee will be able to advise further of uh, how to distribute that, those funds. Thank you. Um, assuming that we can take the action log as noted. And item three is petitions and public question time. We have no public questions this time. Um, we do have a petition from Amy Loveridge, a local resident. Unfortunately, Amy is unable to join us this afternoon, but she's asked that her petition should be presented by Councillor Jan French. Uh, welcome, Councillor French. Councillor French is one of the two local members for March North and Wade Waldersey. County councillors aren't usually allowed to present petitions, but given the circumstances, I'm happy to ex exercise my discretion on this occasion to uh, allow the petition to be heard. Can I ask the Democratic Services Officer to read the text of the petition for the benefit of those watching the meeting? Thank you. The text of the petition is, there are lots of children with special needs that are being held back years and not getting the correct education, which is unfair. A special needs school built in March would help children in need. At the time the agenda was published, the petition contained 665 signatures, of which around 617 were from local residents. Thank you. We're now going to hear from Councillor Jan French. Councillor French, you have up to five minutes to introduce the petition to the committee and share your thoughts as a local member. If you are still speaking at the end of the time, Rishenda will let you know and you will need to conclude your remarks. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you, Madam Chairman, for allowing me to, to speak on behalf of Amy. Uh, unfortunately, her and her son are both ill today. Um, as the petition states, there are many children uh, who have special needs, not just across March, but certainly across uh, Fenland. But March, um, we do have many dozens. Um, many of these children have to travel many miles, and we're talking about five-year-olds in taxis on their own. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want a, my five-year-old travelling in a taxi. Um, apart from that, there are uh, many special need children who are in mainstream schools. Um, which not only is holding them back, but is also holding the education of other children back um, through to disturbance. Uh, and I do know that, um, uh, that there's more or less all the schools in March have got children with special needs. I do hope that um, you will take into consideration March is an allocation, uh, which the planning applications are coming in very shortly, for 2,000 homes in March, um, the allocation of March West. Um, within that plan, there is going to be um, schools uh, and various other facilities. And I do hope uh, that you take on board that when you're looking at a new school, you actually are looking at a sense special education needs for these children. Uh, and it, it would be, um, I think, most grateful for the parents. Uh, unfortunately, the ones that have to travel many miles to take their, their children to school. I understand one of the schools is in Ramsey uh, and it's not. Um, it's not really ideal to travel with a young child to from March to Ramsey. Um, so I, I just ask you, please um, uh, listen to the petition, take into consideration when we're looking at new schools in March. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor French. Do any members of the committee have any questions for Councillor French, please? No? Uh, thank you. Miss Loveridge will receive a written response to her petition within 10 working days of this meeting, which will also be copied to committee members and to local members for information. I'm also going to ask Jonathan Lewis, the Service Director for Education, to give us a brief response now. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Councillor French, uh, for presenting the petition. Um, Cambridgeshire has seen quite exceptional growth in the number of children with additional needs uh, in education, health and care plans. Uh, and this has led to increasing pressures being placed on our specialist settings uh, at a pace that has been unprecedented historically. Uh, the council faces an extensive budget gap on its high needs funding, and this is expected to reach £40 million by the end of the financial year. The pressures we are facing are being experienced by all local authorities, not just in Cambridgeshire. Our capital programme, which we presented at the November CYP committee, included £37 million for the expansion of specialist provision across the county. This included confirmed schemes for the expansion of Samuel Peake Special School, 
permanent accommodation at Spring Common Special School and additional special school places in and around Cambridge City. A free school will also be opened in, in Huntingdonshire in 2023. Our sufficiency planning work has identified the need for additional places in specialist settings across the county in the next 10 years, including those for the children in the Fenland area. A new SEND special school in Fenland may still be needed. However, the strategic direction from the council is to find solutions that can be implemented quickly to ensure children can benefit as quickly as possible. The development and planning of a new school can take up to three to five years. In the October CYP committee, we outlined plans to create an additional 200 special education need places within mainstream schools or other accommodation within the council or school schools estates to meet the existing need for specialist provision for children with education, health and care plans. 2.6 million has provisionally been allocated to these schemes. We have uh, been in dialogue with education leaders in Fenland uh, to see how the capacity of placements in the local area can be increased. And we hope to share plans on the future uh, on this in the future uh, at a CYP committee meeting. It's not practical or affordable to have a special school in every community across the county, uh, but instead we have a proud heritage in our excellent area special schools, which provide local coverage uh, across the county area. Whilst the uh, council is fully focused on ensuring uh, that it makes provision as close to home as possible, there will always be some cases where specialist support is required and that uh, it is not possible to find appropriate provision locally. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, on behalf of the committee, we pass on our best wishes for a smooth recovery, uh, Ms. Loveridge and family. Moving on to the next item. This is item four in your agenda packs. So this is the schools and early years funding arrangements for 2022-23. Uh, Jonathan Lewis, Service Director for Education. And we're also joined by Martin Way, Strategic Finance Business Partner, uh, remotely to present this report, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so this report builds on the report that we presented at the November committee uh, following the announcement by the Department for Education of the dedicated schools grant allocations for the 22-23 financial year um, at the end of last term. Um, as you can see in the table on uh, 2.1 um, on page 16, um, we've now received the dedicated schools grant initial allocations for the next financial year. Um, and as you can see, based on these initial allocations, we're looking at an increase um, from 533 million this year up to 556 million next year uh, across the four main funding blocks. Um, the main allocation of this is obviously the funding um, in the schools block, which is increased from 405 million to 422 million approximately. Um, this is funding which is used to fund all primary and secondary schools, whether they be maintained or academies uh, across the county. Um, the main reason for the increase in the schools block is the, the net increase in pupil numbers between the October 20 and October 21 census. As you can see in section 2.2, um, we've seen it, although we've seen a net reduction of 100 um, pupils in the primary phase, we've seen a net increase of 180, um, 859 pupils rather in, in the secondary phase. So that overall net increase in pupils has, um, has contributed to the significant uplift in funding that we've received in the schools block alongside the changes in the national funding formula. Um, as well as the dedicated schools grant announcements at the end of last term, um, the Department for Education also announced some additional funding, which they're calling supplementary funding, um, which is to be um, allocated by means of an additional grant um, to provide support in respect of both the costs of the health and social care levy and other cost pressures within schools. Um, there's a link there to take to, to further details. Um, based on the initial allocations we're expecting for Cambridgeshire, that funding is going to be in the region of 12 12 million pounds and we will see those figures later this term um, of what those allocations at individual school level level would be. So obviously back in November the uh, school funding formula proposals based on conversations with a schools forum and consultation undertaken with uh, schools and other stakeholders uh, during October of this year. Um, based on the figures that we've received from the Department for Education, we've undertaken some further modelling using the principles set out in 4.1, which we'd agreed um, had been approved by schools forum previously. Um, following initial modelling, we did have a slight overall affordability gap, but that was only four 
£41,000 and I'm obviously on a budget of over £417 million. Um, that's a very, very small percentage differential in, in terms of that funding. Um, at Schools Forum last Friday, we agreed that the uh, they approved the principle of scaling down the uh, block transfer to high needs block and essentially retain growth fund to cover that £41,000 differential, which would mean that we wouldn't have to apply, apply a funding cap to the amounts received by individual schools. Um, Appendix A to so this report therefore shows the uh, proposed current formula funding rates that we will apply for 2022-23 and Appendix B shows the uh, detailed level at school level of the um, changes between last financial and this financial year. Um, one important thing to note is that the allocations themselves will not be finalised until the Education, Skills and Funding Agency have validated our um, funding formula, which we will um, submit to them later this week. Just quickly on early years, um, as well as the um, schools announcements, the early years funding block announcements had a significant increase in funding um, from last year to the year to this, uh, 21p per hour for funded two-year-olds and 17p per um, three or all three and four-year-olds. Um, this is a considerable uplift over the levels of funding increase that we received in previous years. Um, um, as we've done in the last couple of years, the proposal here is to passport these increases on in full to providers and therefore fund the providers at the rates set out in section 5.2. So increasing the hourly rate from funded two-year-olds to £5.78 an hour and the hourly rate for three and four-year-olds to £4.37. Um, I'll pause there unless John has anything else to add. Just a, a, some observations to add, perhaps for the committee. Um, this, this is a good settlement for Cambridgeshire. Uh, it does provide an uplift for our schools, um, but it does not um, go back over the many years of underfunded for Cambridgeshire. Uh, and we still have significant challenges at a school level, particularly in small primary schools, uh, where the challenges will remain. Um, in terms of early years, again, positive to see an increase. This is the largest increase I think we've had in many, many years. Uh, to see that level of increase but we know this the sector is under significant sustainability challenges uh, and we continue to battle to make sure provision is available in the local area but even at these increases that is still an incredibly challenging uh, situation to, to deal with uh, and, and third and finally my observation is around the high needs block again a positive settlement but you've heard from me in the previous uh, item you know the deficit we have on the high needs block the, the increasing needs that we are facing in Cambridgeshire uh, means that despite that substantial increase, we still have huge financial challenges. And obviously the committee business over the next uh, rest of this uh, municipal year and into the next one is gonna be heavily focused in on how do we make that budget balance. So uh, a good settlement, but I think it's, it's, it's good to be cautious and say there's still a long way to go until Cambridgeshire is fairly funded. Thank you both. Uh, we now move uh, now open the report to the committee for questions and debate. Clans Councillor Daunton, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, th thank you, John and Martin, for your explanations. Um, my question concerns small schools. Um, and I noticed, John, that you um, still have concerns over small schools. Um, and I'm hoping that in some instances, the sparsity funding will deal with some of the issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd just like reassurance on that and also just a little bit more information about how the sparsity funding will be allocated. Okay, um, yes, we have benefited from the sparsity factor. There are more schools uh, now accessing the revised arrangement. So uh, it used to be as the crow flies to the next nearest school for a child, it's now as the road distance goes, which, is, which means more of our schools qualify. And um, I have to guard though, that actually it changes year on year, that, that formula and the factor. So as children come and go from catchments, as depending on where they live, we will see variability uh, in that factor. But we have seen some schools that we are hugely concerned about uh, in terms of their funding sustainability benefit from that. But there are still schools that have those concerns who are not qualified for sparsity factor. You know, in terms of the decision making we went through a forum, we've made it as flexible as we can. We've decided to put tapering on the arrangements. So it means that more schools that are in a band uh, below the threshold uh, can benefit from that. I think the piece of work that we've talked about in committee across this year uh, around looking at small schools, how we share costs, different operating models, we still need to do that piece of work because we still want to sustain as many schools as we can in our rural communities. So I think there's work still to be done. You know, there's a commitment from government to continue to support small schools, but it's, it's still a concern for us. 
Thank you. Councillor Hoy, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say it was really good that finally governments listened to our years of lobbying, really, because we've been saying for years we've been underfunded and now we've got more. Of course, as Jonathan points out, it's not enough and we still do need more, but it's nice to actually for once be listened to. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, likewise, uh, I'm very encouraged that that uh, there has been response to our request in the past for uh, more funding, um, particularly for our high needs block, which we know locally, not only is this going up nationally, but we know no locally um, because of the nature of um, uh, employment in Cambridgeshire, uh, we tend to get a higher proportion of um, young people with these special needs. And, and although I'm encouraged that this is a, um, we're reassured that this is a good settlement, and I'm very pleased to hear that from uh, John Lewis. Uh, but I note, as at paragraph 2.3, um, that the report still identifies that this is still significant, you know, the high needs block has increased by seven point something million, which although slightly higher than the indicative allocation, is still significantly lower than the required increase to meet our current high needs pressures. And I wanted to understand um, what further um, work we might be doing to get the government to further recognise the specific needs in Cambridgeshire. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, a very relevant point there. Uh, we, we are meeting with the Department for Education uh, on uh, a termly basis at the moment. Uh, we've submitted to them a plan uh, that shows the work that we are doing, which I shared at the November committee around our transformation programme. So looking at ways we can be proactive, uh, support needs at an earlier stage, reduce our reliance on out-of-county placements uh, and you know make sure that our investment uh, uh, delivers uh, yields in terms of savings um, and obviously that dialogue with the department has been very helpful for them to understand the context of Cambridgeshire and the challenges we face. Uh, we've also been working very closely with the uh, the County Treasurers Association for all the shire counties to, 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 to share our challenges. We think it's a shire county issue uh, that's, that's uh, at the heart of this to do with the, the factors and formula they use to allocate this funding. Uh, and obviously, it, it's our intention, uh, working with the joint administration, to continue uh, the work that the previous administration uh, started to undertake and continue to undertake to make sure Cambridge's challenges are heard nationally. You know, th there are children at the end of that high needs block budgets, and we need to make sure we do everything we possibly can to make sure they have the resources and support they need to thrive uh, and transition successfully into adulthood. Thank you. May I briefly come back, Chair? Is that okay? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Um, what I think we need to point out is that in many ways, the government is recognizing Cambridgeshire as an area of particular growth in terms of both housing, but also in terms of high tech industry all over the county. And that brings with it a concern for high needs children. It brings it brings to our area uh, some adults with high needs as well, uh, but it also brings children with those needs. And so I think we need to really look at our county development holistically and and encourage government to recognise that the needs that that brings to our children. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Atkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, officers, for the work uh, that's gone on into this. I'm sure uh, it's been considerable. Um, and I'm, uh, as with other councillors, delighted at a, a good settlement for Cambridge uh, on this occasion. Um, I wanted to pick up uh, in 4.6, you note that the cost of implementing the uh, minimum per pupil levels is about 6.3 million. I suppose crudely, we could see that as, a, as the size of uh, implicit cross-subsidy perhaps from larger to, to, to smaller schools. Do you think you could perhaps um, characterize that 6.3 million for me? Is it the case that there are a large number of schools which are perhaps nearly sort of sustainable without it and just need a little top up or are there a small number of schools which um, are receiving quite a lot through this protection and that suggests perhaps um, might, might face sustainability issues in the future? Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm more than happy we can we provide that information at school level. So when we publish the school level budgets um, in the end of this week or early next week, um, every school, um, we break down all of the individual factors. So you'll be able to see for every school how much um, minimum per pupil level protection they receive and likewise with minimum funding guarantee. Um, based just on, on the figures we've got, I think you'll find it's actually quite uh, broad across a number of schools. It's tended to be um, the, the uh, larger schools with, um, low levels of prior attainment, low levels of ADACI, where previously their per pupil funding was potentially less than some of the other schools in the county, who've obviously received that protection to get them up to that, that minimum per pupil level. There's actually quite a large proportion, and again, I, I can provide the, the figure outside of the meeting, quite a large proportion of schools who are purely funded on that MPPL level funding now. So effectively, it kind of overwrites all of the other funding formula factors um, to get them up to that minimum per pupil level of funding um, across the board. Um, obviously, as long as the MPPL continues and as long as uh, more funding goes into schools, um, and it should be that those schools are sustainable longer term. Uh, but I think that will be form part of the, the next stages of the national funding formula, which we're expecting the consultation um, later this year um, in terms of when they start to think about moving to more towards a direct funding formula. So from the education schools and funding agency direct to, to those individual schools. And I think that will be a key part of, of those next stages, which we'll, we'll need to keep a close eye on. Thank you. Councillor Slatter, please. Just a comment, really. I wanted to thank um, John and his team for all the work they, they put in for the training that they are uh, giving us um, and the patience with which they repeat themselves if necessary. Um, but also, I'm now I'm using the maps um, and because I got caught out when uh, Councillor Hoy was talking about uh, Whiz Beach and the river. And um, it is, I just want to thank those of you who painstakingly put the information onto the website and correct it when it keeps changing, especially when schools keep changing their nature and whether they're a free school or an academy. All this is there for us to find. And if I couldn't use that, um, I, I would be even more ignorant. So just thank you for the painstaking office work, because that is key for us to make the right, you know, our decisions in an informed way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other comments, we will move to the report recommendations. There are two recommendations. Uh, this is A, to approve the forming formula factors and unit values to be applied in the local Cambridgeshire funding formula for primary, secondary, mainstream schools as set out in Appendix A, and B, to approve the proposed hourly rates for early year settings as detailed in Section 5.2. Are we happy to take them both at the same time? Um, Canon Reid, you are eligible to vote on this item. Would those in favour of the recommendations please raise their hands now? Thank you. Any abstentions? And any against, please? Thank you, Rishenda. Thank you, Chair. That was unanimous. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, John. Item five. Item five is a determined admissions arrangement for 2023-2024 academic year. And this report is presented by Karen Beaton, who is the Strategic Admission Attendance Manager. Karen, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you. Um, I'm here this afternoon to present a paper prepared by Shelley Kingston, the Admissions Operational Manager, and that outlines the admissions arrangements um, that require local authorities to publish information on an annual basis and how we coordinate our school applications for a normal primary, secondary and in-year in applications for children to get a school place within Cambridgeshire. Now, the consultation activities have taken place. Um, and if you have a look at the document that was provided on section two, um, on section apologies 1.2, that will describe to you um, the type of um, approach that the consultation takes and the engagement with um, the parents um, and local other people of interest and in other schools within the area that forms part of this annual consultation activity. As I said, this annual, um, consultation has now um, concluded. Um, further details um, are available on our 
if you and it does provide um, a little bit of information on the outcomes of the consultation, the main issues that we wish to look at today. Um, as part of the consultation, the final part of this is to get agreement that the content is appropriate and that everybody agrees with the, the, the conclusions of the consultation. Um, so with, with respect to the consul, or consultation, um, if you have a look at the paper, um, section 2.1, you'll see outlined within that um, the proposed changes in two schools. So we're looking at Spring Meadows Infant School, and there was a proposal, there were proposals part of the consultation to reduce the PAN from 120 to 60, as well as Newcroft, New and Croft will have a PAN reduction from 34 to 30. We did receive one objection to the plan reduction for Spring Meadows, um, and that was from CMAT. There was concerns there that that would lead to the Isle of Ely expanding and increasing their entry. Um, and it was hoped and it was reflected on and suggested by um, DMAT that we came to a conclusion of a middle ground. Now, the consultation, as you've read, is very much uh, an inclusive ask the officer to turn off sorry Karen we're losing you very slightly could you just repeat that last bit of course I will I do apologize um uh, I, I was just saying that um I'll start at the beginning of the proposals are you hearing me okay now yeah that's good are you sure? Because I can turn my camera off. That might help. Sure. I'll try. I'll do that. Okay. I'll do that. Turn that off. Okay. So I was just going through the proposed um, changes in two schools with respect to their PAN, the number of children on roll. And that is Spring Meadows Infant. And there was a proposal to reduce the PAN from 120 to 60 and Newham Croft, where there was a reduction from 34 to 30. We did receive, as part of the consultation, one objection to the PAN reduction from Spring Meadows, and that came from um, the Academy Trust, DMAT, um, and they were concerned that it would lead to some expansion potentially around the Isle of Ely, and they were looking at maybe consulting with us as a local authority on a middle ground of a PAN of 90. However, there was further conversations by officers in the local authority with DMAT, um, and the conclusion was that there was no evidence to suggest that it was necessary to go to the PAN of 90. We'd looked at some data um, forecasting that to remain below 60 for the next five years, um, would um, uh, obviously reflect the reality that the data was providing. Um, so that those concerns were reflected on and concluded, um, and um, we were, were proposing that the PAN will go down to 60. Um, there was no objections or comments received regarding the potential PAN reduction from Newham Croft, um, and I just want to um, highlight as well the catchment changes around Alconbury Primary School were consulted on and a proposed change to the school's catchment area was to include Upton and there was no objections or comments received regarding the change to the catchment area um, for the Alconbury Primary School during the consultation period. So that is a quick synopsis there, and you can um, review the documentation sent to you on the proposed plan changes and the change to the catchment area for Alcombe Primary. And um, the reason I'm here today is to ask members to approve this documentation and the arrangements within. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you for adjusting your, your video so that we could hear. That's um, very useful. Um, we've also received written representations on this report from Councillor Ian Gardner, the local member for Alconbury and Kimbleton. 
Kim Bolton, sorry. These have been shared in advance with committee members, but I will ask the Democratic Services Officer to read them out now for the benefit of those members of public and press watching this meeting. Thank you, Rishanda. Councillor Gardner writes, as the local member for Alcumbry, I fully support the change in the catchment area for Alcumbry School to include Upton. Parents in Upton naturally want their children to attend Alcumbry Primary as it is the nearest school. The nearest services for Upton are in Alcumbry. Both Alcumbry and Upton are in the same county council and district council divisions. Therefore, Upton residents naturally look to Alcumbry rather than Sawtree. I wholeheartedly support this change. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. I will now open this report to the committee for questions and debate, please. Councillor Slatter, please. Uh, well, that's a very good example of being able to use the maps, and I appreciate uh, the local member, Ian Gardner's um, con uh, contribution. Thank you. Um, may I ask the officer at what point um, local councillors are alerted, um, or is there a central place one can keep an eye on neighbouring uh, divisions? Um, perhaps you could tell me that. Thank you. As in respect to um, other districts' um, admissions arrangements, or yes, changes in yeah, yeah. So in the, local if this schools. was actually. I, I hope this would not be news to me if it was a Trumpington one. On the other hand, some of our residents do use Newnham Croft, and it's important, obviously, when it's controversial, to perhaps be a bit more ahead of the game than seeing it. Absolutely. As yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, that's part of the consultation um, uh, um, consultation and um, process. Um, we're looking at other, um, obviously, other interested um, members and other interested um, uh, um, partners. Um, and that also includes um, adjoining neighbouring, um, not just districts, but local authorities as well. So obviously, when we go to consultation, uh, we'd be um, conferring and um, discussing our proposals with um, Norfolk, Lincolnshire and those other boundary local authorities as well. I was also meaning, would it turn up in my inbox? And if so, what would it look like? The consultation should be turning up in your inbox, yes. Um, so that's the local authority and the admissions um, officer, Shelley and the team um, put the consultation document online and it's sent out as a hard copy. Um, I'm making assumptions that it would be sent to um, appropriate um, members. I can certainly check that, but as far as I'm aware, is sent out to all interested um, 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 officers and um, members as well. John, do a um, apologies. Are you aware of it yes. comes to councillors yet? Yeah, it, it does go out fully. So you should be aware of those uh, consultations that change the schools either in your area or neighbouring areas. So, um, you know, if, if you feel we haven't seen them, let us know. But that's part of the process. Obviously, the challenge is that we are not the admissions authority for all schools mm. uh, and we rely on the Academy Trust or, or the, the diocese to make sure that information is shared. And where we are aware, of course, we will send it on as well. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. Any further comments, questions on this report? Nope. So we move to the recommendations. Uh, Canon Reid, you are eligible to vote on this item. We're being asked to A, determine the coordinated qualifying scheme and admission arrangements for all schools for whom the council as local authority is the admissions authority, as published in the consultation documents for admission to school 2023-2024 and B, to support the proposal that a full and comprehensive review of the determined admission arrangements for all own admission authority schools is undertaken. This should include the published definitions of existing school catchment areas and admission policies for schools with a sick form. Any issues or concerns should be highlighted, recorded and shared with the respective admission authority for the school with a view to these being addressed immediately. Whether in breach of legislation or as part of an annual consultation process for admission to school in 2024-2025, which will commence in the autumn term of 2022. Please don't ask me to repeat that one. That was a mouthful. Um, if everyone's happy, we'll take both recommendations together. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Thank you, Rishenda. I think that was unanimous. Lovely. Thank you. 
So we move to item number six. Thank you, Karen, for joining us. Item number six is the Children's Services Feedback Annual Report for 2020-2021. Joe Schickel, I hope I've said that properly. Uh, the Children's Customer Care Manager is here to present this report today. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here today to present the annual report, which, as you've said, is for 2020-2021. Um, just to lend you some context um, that we're required in leg legislation to produce an annual report um, for under the Children's Act 1989 representations procedure and also as an authority we're required to have a designated complaints manager to assist with the coordination of all aspects of feedback that we receive in relation to children's services. So part of my role is to um, ensure that everybody that needs to be is familiarised with the procedures and the regulations um, and some of the outcomes in relation to the feedback that we receive over the year um, through an annual report. Uh, the annual report should be within your pack, uh, Appendix um, 1. Um, and just a quick summary, the annual report you will see for yourself because you've had opportunity to see it in advance, contains statistical data on the number of compliments, inquiries, MP, councillor inquiries, and complaints received within the year. Um, it summarises some of the themes and the learning and the actions contained with that. But because it's a public report and it has to be published, obviously we don't give specific details in relation to complaints as these are confidential to the complainant. Um, before I sort of go on into the annual report, as you've all had it in advance, I just wondered if there were any questions particularly. Committee, any questions? Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I take the officer's uh, point that complaints are by their nature sensitive and would, it would not be appropriate uh, and we would not want them to be reported in a way that revealed um, the nature of the, the specific location, as it were, uh, of the complaint. But um, I do feel that the report does feel somewhat um, weighty on the compliments and underweight well, absent on a description of the nature of the complaints. And the reason I'm raising that is because, obviously, clearly, we, we learn things a little when things are going well and we get when we get compliments, but actually we learn a lot more when we learn from our mistakes. So I do think it would be more balanced if the report held... Um, some reference to the nature of the complaints um, by category or by general nature of the complaint. And I, I do feel it, 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 it um, because there's no reference at all to the nature of the complaints, I, I think it, it makes me, leaves me wondering why that's been left out. So I think in the, ne in, the in the interests of balance, it would be helpful if the report did make reference to the types of complaints that we receive so that, you, so that we can, as a, um, a committee and as officers, we can learn from those complaints. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do you want me to respond to that? Please, Joe. Yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I think it's I think it's a valid point that you've made. The format of the annual report is well prescripted um, within the government, the accompanying government, govern, government, government, sorry, guidance, which is a document called "Getting the Best from Complaints" that outlines the local authorities um, the types of information that our annual report should contain and. We try to follow that, but I do take your point. We try to address some of the themes um, within the annual report, and you probably can see at 2.1, it talks about communication issues, 2.2, uh, assessment reports and plans, um, and 2.3, work behaviour, 2.4, policy, and then 2.5, other. And in very general terms, they, are, they tend to be the top themes um, of the types of complaints that we receive. Obviously, within those um, bullet points, 
we're sharing with through the report the learning and some of the, the you know the reminders to to staff and officers uh, of the improvements that need to be made um we also include in the annual report um um information about you know where the complaints originate from so you know the, the areas within the authority or within children's services I should say the teams that receive the most complaints or the areas of work whether it be um, children in care um, as an area of work that receive the most complaints but we do resist actually giving specifics about the actual complaints. Thank you. Councillor Bulat please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I thought it was good and encouraging in a way to see the selection, the wide selection of positive comments and thanks staff for their, their work in this year. But also I found it really helpful to have this list of learnings. I think it's in 2.35 and even more detailed in the attached report. And I thought it was quite, you know, quite a long and detailed list of many possible aspects to improve, some more easy to implement than others as well. So my question was really, I was wondering if there is a way to kind of prioritize some of those learnings, like what are we focusing on improving this year as compared to more long-term? Because it seemed to me it's like a long list and like we could prioritize any number of those issues. So I was wondering to what extent we have capacity to work on some of those learnings that are detailed in the bullet pointed list in the report in this year and then in the longer term. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that feedback. That's really, really helpful. Um, obviously, within those bullet points, it gives you a flavour of some of the learning. But um, throughout the year, we also produce quarterly reports. And um, the, the, I suppose the, the most rich learning comes from, well, all, all feedback that we receive, not, not simply complaints. We receive other types of feedback, as, as has been said also. But um, you will see from the report that the that, that complainants have access to a three stage complaint process and some of the real rich learning and the, the real sort of policy changing decisions often come out later at stages two or stage three. And they are implemented throughout the year and they are reported and all that learning is disseminated to the key service managers and heads of service to take forward and to make those improvements within the service. Thank you, that's good to hear. Uh, Councillor Atkins, next please. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for presenting this report. Um, I've got uh, two uh, comments or questions perhaps. Um, first, so if I've understood correctly, this is a report covering uh, April 2020 to March 21. Um, so clearly, uh, if a complaint has been raised, say in April 2020, it's sort of a bit late for us now as a committee to be reviewing it in you know nearly kind of two years later um i don't know if you're constrained uh by some elements of process or by some elements of timetabling but i think it would be helpful perhaps if this report was presented earlier in the kind of following municipal year so that we could see it kind of on a more timely basis because as you know i might ask you a question about this you might say oh yeah you know we, we, we fixed that six months after the complaint was raised um, that doesn't kind of give us much scope as a committee uh, to kind of be involved. So I wonder if either this report could be presented on a more timely basis, um, or forgive me, I think you just mentioned that you do a kind of quarterly report. It may be this is already circulated to us and I've missed it in my inbox, but perhaps if it isn't, that might provide us with a more, um, a kind of fresher, more up-to-date look at some of the kind of current issues that you're experiencing. Um, the second comment I wanted to make was looking through the themes uh, in 2.1 onwards. Uh, something that comes up quite frequently, and I appreciate this is drawing from a small number of complaints, but something that comes up frequently is the, uh, what you might call the kind of recruitment process for new foster carers. Um, and I think that's, that's obviously a concern because we're very dependent on that process working well and, you know, both bringing in, you know, hopefully good numbers of new foster carers and also ensuring that, uh, you know, we manage to recruit the right people to provide uh, the care that's needed. So I wondered, are you confident that the learning's been taken on board from some of these complaints and that that recruitment process is, is performing as we need it to? Or do you think there's still further work to be done in terms of uh, making sure that that works well in all situations? Thank you. Perhaps if I take the first point first, 
And, and then I might ask Lou if Lou wants to assist me with the second point. But in relation to the first point and the timeliness, um, in previous years, certainly this annual report has been presented much sooner after the conclusion of the year end. Um, and I know that originally we were on the agenda for the November committee meeting, um, but unfortunately, we'll see it, it's been pushed back till now. So I, I don't know that 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 is something I think that democratic services may be able to assist with. I don't know if Richenda can assist with the the timeliness of our item being put on the agenda following the completion of that year. Um, and under statutory legislation, we do we are required to produce an annual report. We're not required to produce the quarterly reports, but we do so in Cambridgeshire because we believe they're useful benchmark periods in time to look at data and to feed back to the services to be able to take that learning um, within a three month window and to not rest on our laurels for a whole 12 months before we're reflecting back and actually to take forward service improvements. So we do do that, but that is an internal document. So you won't have necessarily have seen the quarterly reports before now because the requirement is for us to share the annual report um, with elected members, but, but please rest assured that that learning is regularly disseminated through senior manager meetings and through the service and those improvements are happening throughout the year. Um, Lou, did you want to come in about the... Yeah, happy to. So, and, and just to say, just to add in terms of those quarterly reports, they are not public and that means that we can actually go into much more information and detail about the, the themes and the nature of the complaints, which then makes them more valuable for the service. So um, I wouldn't think they would be suitable for, for, for sharing in a public audience. In terms of the fostering side of things, um, there's, there are a range of complaints which, whilst badged around assessment for carers, we have lots of different types of carers who come forward, actually. So they're not always about um, the type of general foster carer to which uh, you're referring. Um, some of them have been around, um, you know, assessments of family members, um, and they can be in quite fraught situations, to be quite honest. And so some complaints are always likely to fall out of those. In terms of the, the general foster care and the general fostering service, this is something that we have reviewed quite significantly over the last sort of 12 to 15 months. Um, and um, I can say to you that we don't always get everything right, but I think in general terms, uh, I'd be confident about the experience that fostering applicants will be receiving from now on, certainly. Thank you both. Uh, Councillor Taylor, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to touch a bit on the compliments because there were many of them um, and I really did enjoy reading them. Um, I would like to commend all the great compliments that were received in that year, 2020 to 21. Um, I think it shows a dedicated, hardworking and thoughtful team in the children's services, especially in the challenges that we've all had to face. Um, within the list of compliments, there are at least 15, yes, I counted them, um, giving praise of the staff who work within the child and the family centres. Um, that Obviously, they used to be called the children's centres. Um, as, a, as a member of this committee, I'm aware that I've not heard much about our child and family centres in the last two years. Um, to, see, to see the compliments is a testament that they are still giving the support, signposting, singing sessions as well, and early help to the residents of Cambridgeshire. Um, in my division, we have two child and family centres, and one of them is in Ainsbury and one is in, um, in Socom within St Neitz. Um, and I know that some have been partly reopened, which is a really, really good thing. Um, but just to let residents know that they can still access these through Facebook. And I think there is a telephone number as well. So, I, I you know, hands up to all of the children's services for their continued support in these really, really testing times. Thank you. I think we all echo your, your thoughts, both on children's centres and also the, the dedication and hard work of uh, all of our, our colleagues. Thank you. Councillor King, please. Um, 
Just to echo what Simone said, Joe Lou, thank you for the report. Thank you for um, letting us read all the uh, all the compliments and uh, and hopefully you can pass our thanks to the teams working so hard. Uh, I my question is possibly getting back to basics a bit, but uh, if I can just ask you to explain a bit more about the difference between statutory and corporate complaints. So from what from reading the report and then going on the council to just understand a bit more, uh, I appreciate that stage two and three are quite different. They're two different routes, right? Uh, and however, when a parent, a foster parent or, you know, a child or whomsoever makes a complaint, they probably, they don't qualify them as one or the other, it's, it's the council. And then there is the notion on page 57 that uh, there is some, there could be some kind of movement between one route or the other and, and that potentially might impact on the outcome of complaint, right? Because you either do it internally within the council or bring in external parties. So, so what is the fundamental principles, how these are characterized and, and why, um, you know, why would, for example, something be moved as it kind of goes through the stages? Thank you. Thank you for that. So yes, in answer to your question, um, uh, within the statutory complaint process, it's very prescriptive. So within legislation, with the supporting government guidance, it's very prescriptive who can complain through the statutory process, what they can complain about, um, and caveats within that. Um, and then you will have seen within my report that throughout that, that year, uh, the local government ombudsman issued new guidance around October time of 2020, updating the previous guidance, clarifying and crystallising some of the, the previous guidance. But in essence, statutory um, complaints relate to children's social care. So other areas of children's services do not come under the statutory complaint procedure. So SEND services and early help services, they do not come under the statutory complaint procedure. They follow the council's own corporate complaint procedure. And every local authority in the country will devise their own corporate complaint procedure and they will all look slightly different. In Cambridgeshire, our corporate complaint procedure does um, have a three stage process. The um, first stage, stage one, is very similar to the statutory complaint process in so much as we would go to the team manager closest to the issue being complained about and ask them to investigate the complaint and to do a response to the complainant. But at stage two of the corporate process, we then escalate it to the head of service. And at stage three, it goes to the chief executive. Obviously within the statutory complaint procedure, um, it's a different process entirely that after stage one, we go external to the council to um, investigators employed outside of the local authority who would conduct a thorough investigation, produce investigation reports that would then go to a senior manager within the authority who would do an adjudication. And if the complainant wasn't satisfied at stage two, they could request to go to stage three of the statutory process, which again, we go outside of the authority to external panel members who then review the findings of stages one and two, and then they make a panel report that then ends up um, with a senior manager within the authority who does a final adjudication. At the conclusion of stage three in both processes, if the complainant is still not happy, they can take their complaint to the local government ombudsman. But um, you will note from my report that following the, 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 the updated guidance from the local government ombudsman, we were able to um, take some of the complaints that we had previously always received and put through the statutory complaint process, through the corporate complaint process, um, rather than taking it through the statutory complaint process because the, the updated guidance um, clarified further that if the issues being raised were not made on behalf of the child uh, or related to the child, but were the parents' concerns, and 90% of our complaints do come from parents and extended family members, not children, then we could take those issues through the corporate complaint process. And so that's why you've seen 
um, a, a change within the statistics provided uh, a reduction in statutory um, complaints and an increase in corporate complaints. Can I just come in there? Just um, I think I think it is, it, as you've heard, it's quite complicated. Um, and Joe is an absolute expert in terms of understanding the legislation. Just to reassure members, though, that if you wanted to make a complaint, you wouldn't need to know whether you needed to make a corporate or a children's complaint. You would just make a complaint. It's our kind of approach uh, to, 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 make, to decide which route is the most appropriate from a statutory point of view, it goes down. And at the very end of the process, if you remain unhappy, the local government ombudsman is still there to kind of make a final adjudication. Thank you. Councillor Daunton, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, obviously, I think it's true, isn't it, that communications is a thread running through the report, whether it's good or bad communications. Um, and I just wanted to ask on point 2.35, um, which is on page 40, um, on one of the bullet points you talk about the um, reviewing the welcome pack. And I just wanted to be reassured that the users of the service will be involved in the review of the welcome pack, because I'm sure that's an important part of the communications process. I can see Lou nodding to that. I think that's a yes for that one. Sorry, it's a bit, it's a bit strange being on there. Uh on the screen and uh, but yes absolutely yes yeah. and, and can i just ask a follow-up on that if that's all right um so uh, another thread that's running through this report inevitably is covid19 um and so i assume that the the welcome pack and a whole raft of other areas of communication have taken on board the changes because of covid19 and and also you're able still to communicate with people who are not so um, IT literate or don't have the right equipment that you're, you are able to take both fully into account? Yeah, we, we, we follow a range of methods of communication and, 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 and do that to suit um, the individuals. And, and clearly, if we're talking about uh, children and young people with some quite complex difficulties who are affected by COVID, I mean, you know, we have staff that will use marketing and other communication methods as well. Thank you. Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so my question comes in two stages. I apologise for the noise of the hoover coming from my right in the foyer. I hope you can hear me. Uh, no, don't worry, the door's fine. I'm, I'm sure the microphone will pick it up. So the, I'm just concerned about the stage one, stage two, and at 2.3 naught in the report, we are advised that the rate at which statutory complaints have been reopened due to dissatisfied feedback being received um, following an initial response reduced again for a second year from 20% to 18%. However, 36% of corporate complaints were reopened, which is an increase. Right, so that's the background. So I'm just wondering, since, some of the complaints we must receive as an authority are likely to be around um, a complaint that a child is being taken into care when the parent feels that's inappropriate. Um, and I'm wondering if that it, you know, inevitably the outcome of some of those investigations will be that that decision was correct. Um, and that might be for the um, the ultimate aim of that might be for the ultimate safety of the child. But I just wondered if that accounted for some of the reasons why complaints go from stage one to stage two, because the parent is still unhappy that their child's being taken into care, but we as an authority feel that's the right decision to be made. So that's the first question. And the second one is, I know from our corporate parenting scorecard that once children are in care, now bear in mind, but this might be in the background of a parent objecting to the child being taken into care. I know that many of those children were having greater success in that being converted to adoption um, and permanence. And whilst that's good for children in care, if that leaves parents 
who are objecting to the original taking into care, then that could be a very great source of complaint um, because then their child is no longer in their um, is no longer their responsibility. So I just wondered, could you just give us some narrative around whether that is the course that's happening, or if I've got if there are complaints about completely other stuff that uh, doesn't doesn't apply to uh, you know my understanding or my wonderings might be misled. So perhaps you could clarify, please. I mean, what I would say, if you're talking about the number of reopened complaints, I cannot remember an occasion where we actually had a complaint from a parent about their children being taken into, into care. That's not, not a particular issue. It, as obvious it might appear that it might be, it's not an issue that, that is raised. Normally, the, the reopened complaints are that they've had a stage one response about you know, their complaint is about a variety of issues, whether it be communication, the workers' behaviour, a policy document or something. They've had a response and that they may accept certain elements of the response, but there may be certain questions that they're unhappy with or they want further clarity about or there are other areas that, that, that they are dissatisfied about. And, and they're, they're not specifically asking to escalate their complaint, but they're asking for more information or they want the opportunity to present more information to be considered at stage one. And, and that is more of an indication, that statistic about where we reopen a stage one complaint to do that clar clarity or to provide a supplementary response. Um, and that either leads to them being satisfied after the second response, or it may lead in a limited number of occasions of them wanting to escalate their complaint. The aspect about adoption. Can I? I'll, uh, I'll come in here, perhaps, Councillor Bradnam. So, uh, matters like adoption um, and actually formal care proceedings, rather than um, some parents ask us to look after their children for us. That's a, a voluntary arrangement. But if we've gone to court to remove children, uh, and certainly adoption orders, they don't fall within the complaints process because that's actually the legal process. So parents have the opportunity to make representations within the court process and indeed to appeal court decisions very often, uh, including adoption decisions. But that's where they would need to make those arguments. The complaints process doesn't seek to review the decisions of the judiciary, if you like. Thank you for that. Thank you both. I think that's everyone who wanted to comment on this report. Um, I suggest uh, we're asked to consider the content of the report and appendices and request a further report. It says in 12 months. Joe, if it works for you in terms of uh, work cycle and also Mishenda, if it works in terms of agenda, I suggest we amend that to within 12 months and uh, see if we can get it earlier in, in the cycle rather than fixing it at 12 months. Uh, assuming that, are we all happy to take that as our recommendation today? I'm seeing nobody shaking heads. Brilliant. Moving to item seven. So item seven is the People and Communities Directorate Risk Register. Um, Charlotte, would you introduce this report, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview. So this is the People and Communities Risk Register. So obviously this includes some risks that don't relate to this committee. So I'm just going to draw your attention to the risks, which particularly relates to children and young people, and particularly the red risks. So there's sort of four broad categories, really, um, in relation to, to, to the red risks. Um, uh, those are workforce, so risks um, 2 and 21, um, there are also some risks uh, in relation to sort of COVID impact. So the report does distinguish between those risks we, which we feel a reflection of business as usual and those which are directly as a result of COVID. And sometimes it will be increasingly difficult to see the difference between the two. Um, so that is risks uh, three and four. And then we also have risks eight, 10 and 11, which I think are more of a reflection of um, difficulties that uh, organisations that we, re we rely on to provide care or placements um, are having. 
And then the last group really is um, the, the risks related to other agencies and their difficulty with providing support to the children and young people that we're concerned about. So that's particularly risk 14 in terms of CAMH services, mental health services. Um, the paper sets out the controls and mitigations that are in place, um, and I won't go through those in detail, but um, obviously we're doing an awful lot at the moment around workforce, so we have got recruitment campaigns underway. Um, we are looking for agency staff where we really can't um, solve the problem ourselves immediately, um, but we are also making a number of changes at the moment to make um, Cambridgeshire a more attractive employer, and that's obviously work in progress, and we'll continue to look at that. Um, in terms of COVID impact, all the things that you would expect us to be doing, we are doing in terms of promoting vaccines, boosters, use of LFTs, sort of proportionate use of office spaces and prioritising services, making sure our business continuity plans are fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. And we are very keen to get staff back into offices wherever possible who have a frontline role, because we're also very aware that their practice is quite... Um, we think that they, in order for them to continue to have high quality practice that, that we would expect, they do actually need to be often in a room together and to talk about kind of what they're doing, get support, exchange ideas. And then in relation to the market, we are um, luck, very fortunately, we have had some additional COVID funding to support not just social care providers, but also um, schools in terms of their infection control measures. Um, and uh, really tried to try to, I mean, John in particular spends huge amounts of time keeping the lines of commu communication open with our schools and making sure that anything we can do to support them, um, we do, and obviously front loading payments uh, wherever possible, such as DSG payments. So that's the summary. Um, if anyone in the committee has any questions, I'm sure between us we'll be able to answer them. Thank you, Charlotte. I can see a number of hands. Um, it's, it's good to have you in the room. I'm struggling with hybrid today. No offence to everyone up there, but you don't notice when I look at the screen, apparently. Um, it's all complicated. Uh, Councillor Slatter first, please. Thank you. Um, yes, I have dif had difficulty understanding this this way of presenting a risk register. Um, I was looking for a column of mitigations and then comparison with previous ones which showed whether the mitigations were working or not, or whether they were gonna try something else instead, which for those of us who are not trying to, you know, do the, the officers, you know, tell the officers exactly how to do things, but we do need to know um, quite what is being done in the way of mitigation to try and reduce the risk. And this, I don't see that in this, have I missed something? Um, because normally it's, this is the risk, this is what we think we're gonna try and do about it. Whereas in fact, what we've got is a sort of risk and then sort of details on why it's working, why it is there, I suppose we actually should know that. Um, and then nothing particularly about mitigation. Excuse me if I've not read your system properly. I think if you continue further down, there is a section with the mitigations in there too. Charlotte's nodding at me. Um, there is, yeah, I mean, thanks, Councillor Slatter. Sorry, it feels very odd talking <clears throat> to you behind me. But um, yes, if you look uh, further on in the report, um, oh, I think there are lots of different ways of doing risk re right. registers. It's yeah. quite a science, actually. <laughs> yeah, the but, trouble is, yes. And in fact, my colleagues have pointed this out to me. Um, yeah. But I know that and I'm coming at this like a member of the public. Um, and that is where, where people expect to see miti mitigations, perhaps even a little note saying the mitigation see below, because it looks as if that's the end of the report, because okay. you then start getting um, alignment with corporate priorities. So we think, oh, that's the okay. end. So to me, we'll, we'll thank make you. that clearer next thank time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoy was next, I think. Yeah, two questions. So the first one was, um, if you remember the last committee, we said that the schools, uh, Wisby, Shaniyats and so on, um, would appear in the risk register as risks because obviously they're risk of not being delivered and they aren't in this and so my question is is there a different risk register that i'm perhaps missing because i'm aware that maybe i'm there's some sort of different register for capital projects and uh can i go to john on that one please yeah my understanding is it would go in the snr risk uh, uh report so I need to check to make sure it is in there and if not perhaps we should put it in ours as well so happy to take that away and have a look at it but we did acknowledge that we would do that so I'll check to make sure it's in there. And if we can add that to the action log please. Councillor Hoy. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then my second point was just on um, regarding, just trying to get to the point, this is quite difficult. Um, it was about the recruitment and retention of social workers, really. And obviously it says that that's an amber risk. And then it says C.21. And then you go to point 21 and it says that we can't uh, get many agency staff, et cetera, which is just, and that's on red. So it kind of suggests this is the problem. This is a potential solution, but that solution is red. And it's relating to obviously safeguarding adults and children. So obviously that's a very real severe risk. And the mitigations in place are um, how, how I suppose my question is, how confident are you that those mitigations are going to work? Because they kind of seem things that would be nice to do and we hoped would work, but how confident are we that they actually will work? Because obviously it's quite worrying if we aren't going to be able to safeguard children. Um, I'll try and answer that and Lou may want to add. I think um, recruitment and retention of qualified workforce is probably one of our biggest challenges at the moment. I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge. It's always been something we've had to put a lot of energy into, but um, it's one of those things where we're going to have to keep taking different steps and looking at what local authorities are doing around us and learning from that and working out what are the things that we can do to both retain and attract people to come and work in Cambridgeshire. So I think that, that what's in the papers sort of reflects that we are it's it's it really is work in progress all the time. So we have an internal recruitment and retention steering group, um, which Wendy has chaired and I'll, and I'll pick up, which is really continuing really to try and take whatever steps we can within the resources we've got to make ourselves, as I say, attractive as an employer. And some of that is about hard measures such as retention payments. And some of that is actually about sort of softer measures such as culture and um, what's it like to work with us. Um, I don't know if Lou or John, because John faces similar recruitment issues. I don't know if they want to add anything. I would just say that obviously, you know, as Charlotte said, it's it's a it's a, it's something you just have to keep keep on at and finding different ways at. One of the things that so just to give some glimmers of hope, yes, it's still a, a a massive challenge, but we are starting to see a trickle. And you know, in this context, we only ever see trickles of of applicants from for permanent roles in children's services. We launched a recruitment campaign just before Christmas. And that does start, to, that does seem to be having some effect, which is good. Um, we will keep kind of monitoring that. Um, we'll refresh it. And uh, the, the bit about that campaign is that we can use different types of materials. So we commissioned an organization to provide a campaign for us that we can refresh and change. Because one of the things you have to keep doing in terms of campaigns is to, to keep it live and interesting. Um, but it is, it's a, it is a real challenge. It's something that's affecting uh, pretty much the whole country, certainly the whole of the Eastern region. Uh, my colleague directors in the Eastern region are very worried about it too. Um, and we're looking as, as an association of directors of children's services to try and kind of create a bit of an Eastern region brand for children's services, that we're a family of authorities, that you'd come and join us, but that gives you opportunities for mentoring and training across the piece. That's worked quite well in the Northwest, apparently. So these are things that we're, you know, we're, we're going to try. In, in order to keep things fresh and to keep keep trying ahead of the curve in terms of recruitment and retention. And I think if, sorry, Chair, if I could add, I think from, from my perspective, it is changing rapidly. I would never have sat here and said supply staff in schools would have been a, a major uh, challenge around recruitment and retention at the moment, uh, but it is because of the context. So again, a bit like Lou, we have to keep going on different routes to it. I think we've solved some of our issues around uh, early career teachers. So formerly NQTs that are now early career teachers seeing a better flow in that, that area, but supply is definitely a significant issue owing to the COVID challenges that we face. Agreed, thank you. I have asked some uh, previously retired teachers if they want to come back, but they've all said no. So maybe we should ask Lou if he wants to come back as a social worker as he's uh, due to retire soon. Um, Councillor Bulat, please. Thank you, Chair. I also wanted to raise some uh, points and concerns about the staff shortages because it seems to me that is like one of the, the key issues here in this uh, report. And of course, this is highlighted on several other committees and indeed, as it was mentioned, it's a huge problem across the UK and obviously our region. Um, and first of all, I want to really say thank you for the huge amount of work that has been going into recruitment. I've seen some really creative social media recruitment campaigns as well. And it's good to hear from Lou earlier that some progress has been made uh, with that as well. Um, but I think we can all agree there is an 
national level context that makes local level fixes particularly difficult. And I think what's really concerning for me is that it seems sometimes that we're doing like a lot of very short term fixes and kind of emergency fixes to mitigate against some of the effects of government policy that's not necessarily great in some in some areas that we can look further at. Um, and also really welcome the, the conversations we have in this, in this administration around the living wage as well, because some staff I'm aware they're not paid the living wage, but equally the pay is not the only factor. And if we think about this, we have what is it now, nine pounds 90 an hour, the living wage for, for this region, well, the non-London living wage, but you get more than 10 pounds an hour in many jobs, like you know, my local Tesco's and many other delivery jobs. So I think it's not only about the pay, it's about actually making it, as you, as you say, a career that people would like to, to be in because increasing pay alone won't be a solution. Uh, some specific questions on the, I think on 21 page 113, uh, similar to Councillor Hoy's point, there is um, a note that we need to increase contact with agency staff and get more agency staff, but then equally the report also notes that we're unable to currently fill the current gaps with agency staff. So I'm wondering, has anything changed? Are there other agencies we're not in contact with? Is there like you know any kind of further comment on this? Because on the one hand, it says that we haven't managed to currently. And so I, what is different basically to make us confident that we can increase that. Um, also, I think a quite a worrying point is that the point uh, about, uh, well, some authorities are seeking permission to exceed payment rate so the basic question here is how can we ensure that we remain competitive in what is a current very difficult market in recruitment um, speaking about national context as well i was wondering what impact do you think the government's new immigration system has on staff shortages locally uh, and what percentage of our staff comes from abroad and how this has changed over time uh, and whether any kind of relaxation in the current government's visa rules made a difference or not uh, i asked this in adults as well but i wonder if any kind of difference in children's um, and finally one comment on the mitigations in building community capacity um, I speak as someone who works in the non-for-profit sector as well, and I think it's positive to say, well, we can build, we should build more community capacity to deal with some of those issues, but equally, you know, a lot of the volunteering sector and third sector is also under pressure, it's also underfunded, and also staff and volunteers are tired, and there's a shortage there as well, so I was wondering uh, yeah, if you have any more kind of reflections on that, on to what extent can we actually build community capacity in the current national context that sector is also underfunded so overall the overarching question is what kind of pressure can we actually put a national government to sort out some of those issues because we can't just have short-term fixes locally so we kind of need to i guess lobby and put pressure on national government as well thank you thank you councillor bulat i'll have a go answering some of those and probably look to um look to uh, Lou to come in on a couple as well. So in terms of agencies, um, we do have a sort of uh, an agency, an internal agency that, that we work with, but we have an agreement that if that agency isn't kind of finding us the staff that we need, we can go broader and that is what we have been doing. Um, I think your comment about the third sector is also under pressure. I think the problem we're facing is the whole public sector is actually under pressure and um, so I think you're absolutely right. It's not as simple as just being able to look for capacity elsewhere. So we're very, very aware of that. Don't know, Lou, if you can answer the question about um, staff from overseas and immigration policy. Um, I think probably more, I, I think that probably has slightly less of an impact in terms of the qualified social work staff, to be quite honest with you. It will have some, um, but it has less of an impact. and and. You know, we 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 as an as an organisation, we have um, not. We've we've tended to try and we've we've avoided um, seeking to recruit from certainly, for example, uh, some of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe that some local authorities had sought to recruit from previously, uh, for a couple of reasons really. One, um, I think there is a, a, an ethical question about doing so when we know that those workers are in short supply in those countries as well. And two, actually, the, the, the difference in the legislation and practice is very significant for children's social workers. Um, so you're effectively bringing people in who, whilst they might have a qualification, are um, almost newly qualified in terms of their experience in, in the kind of UK context. However, I do think 
that um, the overall shortage of workforce does have an impact in other parts of the sector. Um, so probably in relation, I, I suspect potentially in childcare, I suspect potentially in some of our um, non-qualified roles. Uh, certainly we've, we've in the past recruited from uh, European communities there. Um, as Charlotte says, it all kinds of all of these factors sort of add up to a real challenge that we're all facing across the sector as a whole. Thank you. Councillor Hay, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is an annual report. What I would like to have seen was the results of the risk rating a year ago so that we could see the direction of travel, what the change was. I mean, so on this particular risk register, in 2.4, it says that, um, where is it? A small number has been reported as red rated. I don't call nine out of 26 a small number with 14 amber and only three green. So to put this in context, I would, uh, as I say, I would have liked to have seen what it was like a year ago so that we could see the direction of travel because obviously some of these have got worse because of COVID, because COVID is mentioned so many times and that just would put a whole lot more context around it. Thank you. I'll take those comments away. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, OK, so this is a, a sort of general point. It, it kind of plays into number two and number 21 on the risk register, but it's, it's a general um, observation. And that is, and, and I will echo the sentiments of my erstwhile colleague, Councillor Downs, who always used to say this, and that is, if money is tight, uh, sorry, I paraphrase, he wouldn't have said it like this, but I will use my words. If money is tight and you've got to choose where to spend your money, then put it in early with children, because it just seems to me that I just wanted to find out from our officers, do we have a recognition in our policies that money spent in early intervention with families is money spent well because it reduces our costs later on down the line and i um you know this holistic work that i know our officers are extremely good at doing um i just want to check that we are remembering that especially when uh, our, our finances are so stretched because that early intervention can 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 prevent problems later on so i'd like to have some clarification on that, please. Yes, Councillor Bradnam, I think you saw Lou and John um, furiously nodding there. That's absolutely critical to the way in which we've um, set up um, all our services. And I think we've worked really hard actually to make sure that we've got a good set of sort of um, early intervention and preventative services in place wherever possible. But most importantly, that we're intervening at the right point in, in children and young people's lives. So. It, I can absolutely confirm that it's central to the way in which we approach, um, you know, improving outcomes for children, young people and families. And I think there's plenty of evidence of, of that in terms of the, the way in which we organise ourselves and the kind of support that we provide. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think the uh, SEND transformation and the Children's Collaborative would come under that and the children and ma maternity work that we're looking at doing too. Um, Councillor Maguire, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to raise a, a similar point to the very first one that was made at the start of the debate, which I think is Councillor Slatter made one, um, and or latterly Councillor Hayes, in terms of the presentation. If we're going to receive a report such as this, I'm also concerned about the way in which it's presented it, to, make, to make it meaningful to us as members. Um, and if you could in, would indulge me, Chairman, I'm actually going to draw your attention to um, risk 24 and subsequently 25, although they're actually relating to, to the adult service, um, it is a report for us, but it's a generic problem. If you look at the, the actual risk, it says unable to conduct adult care report and due to business intelligence capacity, but the details given don't actually refer to a, as a capacity problem. They talk about the BI team 
have delivered a small number of reports, but have encountered unanticipated complications, meaning delivery is now forecast to be phased. And it goes on like that. And then it says in the second paragraph, a lack of day-to-day -day management reports impacts on management of day-to-day -day risks. And if you pick that up onto item 24, as changes across COVID continuously changes, so does the way our service needs to operate. Sorry, but to me personally, that was gobbledygook because I didn't understand how that related. Um, and this, as I say, this is a generic issue right across some of these reports, how that actually related to the risk, which is actually more related to the other the rest of the, the debate where it's to do with the capacity problems and our ability to recruit. But the, but the details don't cover that. Um, so I hope that you understand what I mean. And I, I could ask the senior management <laughs> that are here if they could maybe have their discussions amongst themselves as to might be better right across the, the council in presenting this type of risk register report make it a little bit more meaningful to us as members. Thank yes, you. thank you, Councillor McGuire. McGuire. Just to confirm, I've, I've, I've heard all those comments and I will take them away and we'll see what we can do with the next report. Reflect your um, concerns. Thank you. Um, I think it's Councillor Daunton next and then Councillor Slatter, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'd like to look at the two, two of the three green areas. Um, the first one on page 113, um, and I think it would really be helpful there if the work of the district-wide community safety partnerships was actually spelled out, because I think, in fact, that's what is being referred to here. And those are the operations, the organisations that actually deal with an increased risk of um, crime and antisocial behaviour. So I think, you know, just spell it out, uh, the, the community safety partnerships and their work. Um, and then on um, page 117, um, the Think Communities approaches. Um, there's a bullet point there, a new unified approach operating model and business case developed. I'd just like to know um, exactly what that is all about and to have some reassurance that we will see that um, more developed operating model here at this committee, as well as at the COSMIC committee. Um, yes, certainly. Um, the COSMIC committee, is, I think, has got the lead on that. But I think if there are aspects of that that uh, will be of interest to this committee, we can probably build them into possibly a future service director report. I think that's probably the best place to to do that, which um, we will be doing. So I'll make sure that we include that. Thank you. Councillor Slatter, please. Yes, I was going to apologise for picking on one of the few green ones, <laughs> um, uh, echoing what Councillor Dalton has just said. Um, we are all, we, uh, we are, our inboxes are full of concerns about antisocial behaviour, and we know that in the nature of things, this often involves young people. So it does, it is right that we have it coming to this committee, but it is absolutely imperative that this committee is well aware of our partners. And you don't, and you do need to spell out that in, in the, that the district councils are major partners and the police are major partners. Now, we assume that the professionals working in this uh, area, particularly if it's got as far as the uh, youth offending team, will be aware of that. We've seen the compliments of what amazingly good work they can do. Um, but it does need to be on the risk register. And if you look at number 20, one could do it out almost all the first sentence because um, the, it, it, these things have been always the, way, the case, but we do have different ways of dealing with it now than in the, say, the. 19th century, um, and we need to be making sure that they're in here, because it's not enough to say maintain strong focus on daily risk management. Well, not all of our workers are going to be doing that, but we do need to know who is supposed to be doing it, and who is making sure that those contacts are made. I've spent the last two months shuttle diplomacy um, between the district councils, the police, um, and, and so on and so forth about antisocial behaviour, which happens to be on county council property. This shouldn't be you know, such a laborious business. It, there should be more automatic clicking in um, of our partners. And this is a very good place to put that. Um, and then maybe next time when we can look at it again, and I do agree we need to see direction of travel, we can see, well, has this happened? And is it actually, are we doing it better? Um, because at the moment it, it is not good and it is causing a lot of community tensions 
maybe the actual report does need to go to COSMIC and I'm sure that committee members here or aren't members of COSMIC as well will keep informed about that. Um, it doesn't need to come in two places, but the risk does need to mention partners. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think we obviously it's a big report already. So, um, you know, the purpose of this report is to bring to the committee an overview of the risks that we think particularly relate to this and the other committees. But I will absolutely take on board your point that we should have made a stronger reference to um, the role of community safety partnerships and partners within that uh, description. Thank you. I don't think I've missed anybody, have I? No hands waving at me. Um, we've asked, been asked to note the risk register and we have done so. The final item on today's agenda is the committee agenda plan, training plan, appointments and local authority school governor nominations and appointments. We'll take all these in turn. Um, Rishenda, do we have any changes to report on the published committee agenda plan, please? Um, there are no changes to report other than um, obviously adding in the children's services report that the committee's asked for uh, within 12 months. Um, would just draw members' attention that an additional meeting date has been arranged for Tuesday the 17th of May uh, and calendar invites for that will follow shortly. Thank you. Uh, the committee training plan is attached at Appendix 1. Are there any questions or comments on that, or can we take it as noted? I know we've had two very good trainings recently. Councillor Daunton, please. Um, well, we're really just actually to make the point that you've been very, well, very good, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appendix 2 is committee appointments. There are no changes since the last meeting, so unless there are any questions, we'll take it as noted. Thank you. And Appendix 3 contains the local authority school governor nominations and appointments between August and December 2021 for noting. I'd like to place on record my thanks to all of those who give up their time to act as school governors and who make such an important contribution to our schools. Uh, I know we have at least one school governor in the room, so my thanks directly to you. Are there any questions on these nominations or appointments or can we take them as noted today? Councillor Slatter. Um, I regret that we're still failing to fill a vacancy on SACRE, which is one of our statutory uh, responsibilities. It means that Committee D is in danger of being in court sometimes. Um, and um, I would urge um, members to notice there is still a vacancy and hopefully fill it. Thank you. I'll take that one back to Spokes as well. Um, that brings us to the end of today's meeting. We are next due to meet on Tuesday, the 1st of March. Um, thanks, obviously, to John and Lou and everyone else who joined us online. I know it's been very complicated for you and you certainly can't see when I'm nodding at the screen. Um, thank you very much. And uh, apologies for your last meeting being online, Lou, and not in person. I now declare this meeting closed.